Well, welcome everyone. My name is Joy Michano. I'm a consultant with MnDOT. I will be your facilitator and moderator tonight um, for the open house. Also, um, before we get started, um, we also like to do our land acknowledgement. And um, as many of you know, yesterday, or may have not known, yesterday, October 11th, was uh, Indigenous Peoples Day. Um, so in honor of that day, but also as a regular practice, we'd like to do a land acknowledgement. Uh, so we want to acknowledge that the study area for the Highway 13 corridor study is located on land and near water that is the current and ancestral home of the Sioux Dakota community. In the state of Minnesota, there are 11 sovereign Native American tribes comprised of seven Ojibwe, Chippewa, Anishinaabe federally recognized reservations and four Sioux Dakota communities. The four Sioux communities were originally all one reservation recognized by treaty, which spanned 10 miles on each side of the Minnesota River. However, after the US-Dakota conflict of 1862, Congress rescinded all treaties made with the Sioux and subsequent, subsequently people were forced from their homes. The communities as they exist now are small fragments of the original reservation and were restored to the Sioux beginning in 1886. One of the four Sioux communities is the Shakopee Midwakanton Sioux community. They are a federally recognized sovereign Native American tribe located in Scott County. They are a community of Dakota people whose ancestors have lived in the region near Shakopee for centuries. The Dakota people are part of the great Sioux nation. We acknowledge the painful history of genocide, forced assimilation, and efforts to alienate the indigenous inhabitants from their territory here. We honor and respect the many diverse indigenous people still connected to this land. All right, so getting on to our meeting, um, we want to do some welcome and introductions. So I will ask Carolyn Adamson, who is our project manager on Highway 13 to give us a welcome. Thanks, Joy, and thank you everyone for joining us tonight. Um, we're really excited to come and Give you an update on what we've been doing for the last two years now that we've been working on this project. Um, we've tried to do some report outs throughout the course of the project, um, but we're getting close now um, and looking at construction starting in the spring. Um, so with that, hopefully you'll find out some new things, um, have any questions answered. As Joy said, feel free to leave comments in the chat or at the end of the presentation, um, feel free to unmute yourself and ask some questions. Um, Joy, I'm assuming you'd like me to introduce the MnDOT staff that's here tonight. Yeah, that would be great. Thank you. Yes. So um, as I said, I'm Carolyn Adams, and I'm the project manager for MnDOT. Um, tonight, we have Michael Corbett is with us. Uh, Michael has his video on, it looks like. And let me see who else we have here. Hello. Thank you. Uh, Ryan Wilson. Ryan, do you want to say hello? Good afternoon. Thanks for being here. I'm Ryan Wilson. I'm the South Area Manager for MnDOT Metro, so covering Dakota, Scott, and Carver counties. Happy to have you here. All right. I thought I saw Diane. Yep, there's Diane. Hi there. Hi, I'm Diane, Diane Langebach, and I'm the South Area Engineer for Scott County, and I'm very glad that you're here tonight as well. So welcome. And then we have Allison Bereth. Hi, I am the um, MnDOT project engineer for construction. All right, thank you, Allison. Thank you everyone for being here tonight. Um, I believe that is all of the MnDOT staff we have here. Um, Great. Do you, to, do you wanna do agency partners, Joy? Yeah, so we do have some of our agency partners here tonight, and please shout out if I forget to see it. It's hard to see uh, some people as I share my screen, um, but I did see Sang from the City of Savage. Sang, if you want to say hello to everyone tonight. Good evening, everyone. Sang Tolvan, City of Savage, City Engineer. Uh, welcome. Great. I don't see any other project partners with us tonight, um, but let me know. Um, Angie, if you wanna introduce yourself and some of the consultant team members, that would be great too. Sure, hi everybody, I'm Angie Bursaw with Bolton and Mink. I am um, on the consultant team leading the corridor evaluation. 
Craig? Yes, hello everybody. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, Craig Haas on the consultant team. I have been the uh, design manager um, for this project. All right, and how about Tony? Hi everybody, I'm Tony Rochadel. Uh, I'm the business liaison uh, during construction for the project and I've also been involved in the design working with Craig to, to bring this towards construction. Great. And as I mentioned, I'm Joy with the consult, um, also with the consultant team working on communications and engagement for the project. And also behind the scenes, Ashley Thompson, my colleague as well. Um, we also have Abby Ginsberg with the um, Federal Highway Administration. Abby, if you want to say hello. Hi, I'm Abby Ginsberg. I'm a transportation engineer in the uh, Federal Highway Administration. Uh, Minnesota division, and uh, I guess I would be referenced as the overall project contact for this project. Great, thanks, Abby. And also, we had Lisa Freeze with Scott County join us. Lisa, would you like to say hello tonight? Hi, I'm Lisa Freeze, and I'm the Scott County Transportation Services Director. Great, wonderful. Uh, for our presentation tonight, I'm going to hand it over to kick it off with uh, with Carolyn Adamson. Um, we'll just do a project overview, um, talk about our construction staging for Dakota Avenue intersection, um, the traffic management plan for that, and the next uh, schedule or the next steps and schedule. All right. Thank you, Joy, and thank you again, everyone, for coming tonight. Um, you know, many of you have been along with us along for the last two years talking about this project and looking at not only what does the corridor need, but what are some kind of first original or first projects that we can do out of this corridor study and where we can do with that. Um, we are looking, are excited to share with you tonight the progress that we've made, where we're at in the process, as well as talking about what some of the next steps are. So I believe Angie will talk you, walk you through the project overview and then we'll turn it over to Craig to go through the construction staging and the traffic management plan. And then at the end, we'll wrap it up with next steps and what our upcoming schedule is going forward and then leave time for any questions or comments um, to hear if anyone has concerns or questions for the project team. And with that, I'll turn it over to Angie. All right, thanks, Carolyn. So some of you, um, if you've attended past meetings, this will be a little bit of review, but I did want to kind of go back um, to the beginning here and talk about the corridor as a whole before we get into the specifics of Dakota Avenue and the upcoming construction project. Um, as we set out on this project, we were really after a couple different things, really trying to understand the needs and, and the opportunities on the corridor and so that we could reach consensus on a long-term vision or visions for the corridor. Um, and that we also had our eyes on, you know, a funded freight improvement project at, at and near the Dakota Yosemite area. Um, so how can we kind of get us prepared for both of those? And I wanted to just point out the map here. We'll be talking about both of these as I go through the, the presentation. But our overall project area is shown in the blue color, and that's from basically the 169-101 interchange area all the way over to Nicollet Avenue in Burnsville. Um, we, uh, the Dakota and Yosemite project area is shown in orange, and then we have identified and we'll use the word corridor vision, corridor footprint. Um, we're, we'll be getting into some specifics on where did, where did we end up with recommendations for the corridor between Clinton and Nicollet Avenue. So the needs out there today, um, you know, we have a lot of demand on Highway 13, more demand than um, can be served at this time with the current configuration of the roadway. Um, we have several intersections that have higher than average uh, crashes. And we have some safety concerns just with the mix of traffic and modes that are using Highway 13 with vehicles, freight traffic, um, transit, and people wanting to walk and bike across the corridor in a few locations. So really trying to understand um, those needs and, and safety concerns and identify improvements to address those. As Carolyn mentioned, we've been at this for a few years working through the corridor evaluation 
Um, near the end of, of last year and into the early part of this year, we were getting some consensus around that ultimate vision for Highway 13, and we shared that at public open houses and business advisory meetings and website recordings. And then we moved into our environmental um, documentation phase where we were looking at the entire corridor, not just the first construction project, but the entire corridor um, to secure environmental approval. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later in the presentation here, but we have um, completed that process and are now entering the phase, um, you know, gearing up for 2022, completing the final design and beginning the construction of the Dakota Yosemite area. So um, I wanted to talk just a little bit about where we left off with recommendations for the overall corridor itself and the, the footprint of it. And really what we were after was to try to define um, where, where will we have access along the corridor and what type of access? Is it full movement um, intersections? Is it something less than full movement intersections? And then what type of intersection? Is it at grade? Um, some sort of grade separated uh, or a mixture called a hybrid, maybe partial grade separation. And also where do we have local road improvements? Things like frontage roads or other local roads to support the overall network. We uh, went through a process, identified a lot of different alternatives, um, came up with a, a footprint of, you know, here's, here's a few options that we think will work in the future. Um, and what is the, and, and then looked at the footprint of those. So what is sort of the, the outline of those various improvements to try to determine what are the impacts and work through that environmental clearance process. This does allow for a streamlined future process um, for projects other than the Dakota Avenue as, as funding is identified and, and projects come to fruition. So just really quick here, uh, the recommended access scenario for Highway 13. Um, I, I'm, I'm going to just cover the, the black circle areas here. So the 169-101 area, um, Zinran Avenue, Highway 13-101, County Highway 5, and um, 35W intersection. We are not proposing any in, in any changes to those intersections at this time. Some of them have been recently updated like 13101 and the County Highway 5 interchange um, and county and the 35W and 169-101 areas were sort of out of our scope of what we are looking at here, um, but definitely will be looked at or considered in the future as needs are identified. So we're really focused in on the areas um, shown with the, the circles in color, the P's and the S's. And, and what that is trying to identify is we, we were trying to figure out where do we need to have full access, full movement intersections, and those are called primary intersections. So we, we identified those at Dakota, Quinton, Chowan, and Nicollet Avenue. And then where would we have perhaps secondary, where they could be full movement in some of our options, or they could be restricted or something less than full movement. And those were at Lynn Avenue and Washburn Avenue. And then you can also see um, that we, we were looking at, you know, what is the network need itself? So where do we need some frontage road extensions or perhaps some local road improvements? And where we ended up, I'm, I'm not going to go through um, all of the different options tonight. We've, we have that available on the project website where we can look specifically at the different options that we're carrying forward. But we did choose um, to bring three different variations of future corridor visions into the environmental document. And you know they're there to pick up in the future as funding is identified. And what we brought through was an at-grade corridor, so something that um, provided that capacity and safety improvements that we were we sought to identify and 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 correct um, through some intersection designs. Um, as an example, is a picture up here where it's it still provides full movement, but it's sig adding signals and U-turn movements to um, to carry the traffic flow. 
Um, we also have a corridor vision that would do something where it's a mix of at grade and partial grade separations. And we call that our hybrid. And the and a 13101, you know, the intersection that's out there today is a very good example of what we mean by a hybrid, where it's free flow for Highway 13 in both directions, but we still do have an at grade intersection that's accommodated in this case under, under the um, eastbound lanes. And so a hybrid corridor could include, um, you know, sort of alternating north and south visions of this hybrid alternative intersection at the accesses that I previously identified. And then we also brought forward freeway options. So we had two freeway um, variations that we brought forward into the recommendations where that's more traditional freeway where you see things like interchanges, access closures, um, over, overpasses, where it's a completely free flow and grade separated condition. Now we chose um, to bring all three of those corridors and their, you know, sort of the outline of the, the worst case footprint of those three into the environmental document to leave us some flexibility. We recognize that we were doing this, this evaluation and this study during some pretty uncertain times with traffic volumes and traffic patterns due to the pandemic and also funding. And so we wanted to make sure that we left um, as much flexibility for the future as we could as we went through this, um, this environmental process. And then the, the other component of this um, was, you know, once we identified those variations of corridor visions, you know, sort of coming back to the first construction project or at Dakota and Yosemite avenues. And we worked through an evaluation process that looked at eight different alternatives of how can we provide safe and efficient access in this area and um, came up with a preferred design here of a tight diamond interchange. And just a, a really quick overview, um, this map is simplistic, but it, it, it does highlight the, the main elements here with you know, Highway 13 going over Dakota Avenue in both directions, and then having um, inner, you know, building interchange ramps um, to provide on and off, um, or sorry, off and on movements for those um, movements on and off the highway and access to Dakota Avenue. We do have um, a north frontage road that we're adding on the north side of Highway 13 to provide access to Yosemite and Vernon. As you will see with this interchange design, we are focusing all of the access then from the highway on and off at Dakota and using the frontage road systems both south and north of Highway 13. Um, there will be an exit ramp going westbound that exits the highway um, just east of Vernon Avenue to provide access to um, the ports in that area and a one-way frontage road to provide access over, you know, continue that access over to Yosemite, and then a two-way frontage road from Yosemite to Dakota. And on the south side, um, in the kind of lighter blue color here, there is a, you know, a frontage road system that exists. We're making a little bit of modification to that to allow for the construction of the interchange ramps. So that is Dakota Avenue, and we'll come back to talking about the staging and traffic impacts and more of those details specific to Dakota here in a minute. But I did want to just kind of wrap up then where, um, so bringing those three different corridor visions into our environmental process and then looking at an implementation plan, you know, obviously three different visions, we could have, you know, multiple different implementation plans. We chose just to do one implementation plan that was illustrative of, you know, just the general sequencing of how we're thinking about improvements on the corridor. And as an illustration, this is actually showing one of the freeway um, visions as an, again, just a representation. So what this is showing is um, the first construction project or project one is occurring in 2022 and 2023 at Dakota Avenue between, and that does include the frontage road construction as we had talked about. Um, as we thought about what would make sense in terms of the next project, um, we did think that it made sense to be investing and in improving the Chowan Avenue intersection. Um, again, trying to really get the Chowan um, intersection and associated frontage road that's shown in the green here in place 
and um, you know, providing safe and efficient access before we would move towards looking towards downtown Savage. So that was the thought process there is, you know, let's get Chowin established and set up. And then following that, you know, look at Washburn Avenue. Um, I think in a perfect world, you could do both at the same time. I think that will depend on funding. And so we did show these individually that they could be built incrementally. So in this case, with this freeway example, um, Chowin was an interchange, Washburn was an overpass. And then after we have the access set up, um, coming back and looking at perhaps a local road extension that's been talked about and platted in the city of Savage um, between Chowin Avenue and Lynn Avenue here in the dashed um, orange color. And then at that point, looking at Quinton and Lynn Avenue sort of as a pair that they really kind of work together depending on the alternative that would get built, but thinking about how downtown Savage is served with access that you would want to do those um, in concert with one another. And then finally, at a time to be determined would be um, you know, really kind of a, a city decision if and when Quinton Avenue would be improved to make it more of a traditional two-lane um, two -lane local road connection. And then finally, last but not least, um, I do want to mention Nicollet Avenue. Um, that one is really not time dependent. So you can see we do have a sequence of project one, two, three, four. Nicollet Avenue really could happen as project number two. It could be number three. You know, it, it's sort of independent and it could occur on the timeline that makes sense um, with funding for that intersection. And I should mention, also at Nicollet Avenue, we did have the very same variations that we did for the other intersections of at grade, um, a hybrid option, and a full freeway type intersection option. So that, that's our general sequencing plan. Um, this is definitely um, funding dependent and timelines are, are definitely going to um, depend on when that funding is secured. But the intent of putting a plan like this together and at least even thinking about sequencing and what would come first and second um, is to have agency partners all on the same page so that you know, there's a unified front to try to go figure out how to fund and what's next and um, to make these things happen. And finally, um, last piece of the corridor vision here was just our environmental assessment process. You might have participated in a public hearing we held at the end of June. We, we did complete an environmental document. It was a unique document for this, um, this type of project where it covered the specific details and impacts and mitigation for a Dakota Avenue um, tight design interchange. And then it also looked at, you know, sort of that footprint for all of the other at-grade hybrid freeway options for the other intersections along the corridor between Quinton and Nicollet Avenue. And we worked through that process. We held a public comment period um, between June and July, our EA public hearing at the end of June. And as of October 1st, we have a signed um, finding of no significant impact, which is sort of a milestone um, to you know, lay out the plan for mitigation for future improvements and to, um, or for the Dakota improvements so that that can move forward into the construction phase. And as future projects are funded along intersections like Quinton or Nicollet, um, there will have to be sort of an updating of this environmental document, but a lot of the legwork has been done um, with the, the clearance that we've secured as a tier one type layer already. So a big milestone for the corridor and for our Dakota Avenue project. So now I'm gonna turn it over to Craig and we're gonna jump into the details of Dakota Avenue construction staging. Thanks Angie. All right, so really kind of focusing in on that, that first project that Angie was talking about from the corridor at, at the Dakota area here. And this is a, a, a very nice summary graphic um, that, to start us off here on, on how this project's going to get built at Dakota Avenue. Um, and really, it does start uh, next spring, uh, spring of 22. 
uh, we are seeing this as a two year project. So there is uh, quite a bit of construction to do um, in the interchange area, um, taking Highway 13 up and over Dakota Avenue, building bridge, building ramps, and then uh, frontage road. So um, it is a, a full slate of activity um, in, in two seasons, two construction seasons. Um, really what's gonna happen is uh, we will need to restrict traffic on Highway 13 down to two lanes total, so one lane each way um, to really start constructing this project. Um, we will need to build some temporary pavement right off the bat, and I'll get to why we need to do that in a, in a few minutes here. Um, I mentioned that bridge construction and then also road work along Highway 13. Uh, once November 22, uh, we start getting close to winter there, uh, we're going to suspend construction and reopen uh, Highway 13 to four lanes, um, two lanes each way, um, and restore that through the winter. Uh, and then getting into the spring of 2023, the following construction season, we will need to uh, restrict traffic back down to two lanes, one lane each way. Um, so we can start, uh, or, or so we can uh, build the uh, Dakota Avenue ramps and then uh, finish the uh, work along Highway 13. Uh, really kind of estimating midway, midway into the construction season. So June, July of 23, being able to restore lanes back to, restore back to four lanes on Highway 13. And we'll end up, um, that'll allow us to build the north and south frontage roads. Uh, after that, with completion in November of 2023. Um, so while we are constructing this project, there are other projects um, occurring in the project area. Um, I-494, which uh, really will be, um, I, I think a, a bulk of the construction will start in 2023. And um, really, that was one project that we were coordinating with that we needed to get uh, four lanes of traffic back open by, uh, if you recall, uh, June or July of 2023. That's when uh, um, that 494 project will start. So we needed to get four lanes of traffic back up on Highway 13 um, when, that, when that project started. Uh, there is some work along I-35W. Um, from the Minnesota River Bridge and 82nd Street. And then there's also some uh, resurfacing, pavement resurfacing work along County Road 42 um, in Dakota County. So from the Dakota County line to County Road 11, uh, which we are coordinating with that project as well with the uh, construction of this project that we're talking about. So um, really, we've developed a traffic management plan um, for, for this area during construction. And maybe I, you know, with this, taking a, uh, maybe just a little step back and, and giving you more of the story on how this staging evolved, um, how the staging scheme evolved, uh, evolved uh, through the course of the last uh, few months. And Really, uh, we looked at multiple different uh, options of, of constructing this. So when we, when we developed the, um, the design for the, for the interchange itself, we, we were keeping um, construction of it in mind while we were designing it and, and, and how we're gonna design that, how we're gonna, how we're gonna construct this and maintain traffic um, throughout. And, and so we took that into account when we were uh, laying out the interchange and it, it helped us when we were evaluating because we looked at multiple different uh, ideas through here. Do we, do we shut down traffic completely on Highway 13 and, and build this or do we try to maintain traffic through here? And so we weighed of, uh, those couple of options and ultimately with our agency partners decided to uh, maintain traffic uh, through the interchange during through the interchange area during uh, during construction through what we call the pipeline scenario and and really what we mean by that is um, like I mentioned one lane of traffic each way but 
um, to limit access from Dakota and Yosemite and Vernon uh, to Highway 13, to and from Highway 13, to kind of help with um, traffic through the construction. Um, so for limiting, so by limiting access through there, we needed to provide um, access to the ports and access to the south frontage road business um, via via U turns that we we uh, show here on the graphic. Um, maybe backing up just a little bit here, maintaining access to the ports and maintaining access to our businesses along the South Frontage Road was very, very important to us as we were developing uh, the construction staging for this. So it's something that we took very seriously as we were um, laying out this construction sequencing. Um, but back to the U-turns, uh, um, these U-turns are, are really, what they do is uh, provide access to the ports through construction. And so if um, you are coming from the West and you wanna get into the ports, like I mentioned, we closed access at Dakota, we closed access at Yosemite, um, there's gonna be a U-turn at Quinton Avenue um, for, these, for, our, for our freight traffic to be able to access the ports and they'll take that U-turn at Quinton Avenue. Uh, we mentioned that that is signalized. So that'll be part of the, of the signal system for um, uh, with Quinton Avenue. So it'll share, um, share with that signal there. So when there's a green light to make that U-turn, um, all the rest of the approaches at Quinton will have a red light. So um, really um, allows the freight traffic to make that maneuver into the ports. And then, um, We'll have a one-way frontage road um, that from that U-turn, you'll have a one-way frontage road that gets you access to Yosemite, to Dakota. And then if you're leaving the ports, uh, you uh, can continue on westbound Highway 13. And if, if your destination is to continue westbound, then you're fine. Uh, if you do want to get eastbound, uh, we, are, we did, are going to provide a U-turn underneath that high T, that, that high T bridge over at uh, 13 South, uh, 13 and 101 South there. There's a space there to uh, be able to turn around and then um, merge with traffic at the, uh, the ramp that goes from 13 North to uh, 13 East, I'll call it. Um, so there's that, uh, so that, that covers the ports. Now to, really kind of touch on the south frontage road itself um we're gonna we're gonna have detour signage for folks to know how to get you know to to be able to get to the south frontage road again i mentioned that maintaining that access to those businesses is important so um we'll have a detour uh to use 126th street um and louisiana avenue to get to the South Frontage Road uh, businesses. And then also, for, if you're coming from the east, um, that, that signage will take you down Quentin Avenue and to 123rd um, to the Frontage Road there as well. So really kind of covering our bases on both ends with the ports and the South Frontage Road businesses. So that's, the, that's really kind of setting up the scenario that we uh, wanted to achieve out here with our sequencing now. I think. Uh, our next slide here is actually the sequence in itself here. Thanks, Angie. Um, so really getting into, okay, I, I kind of touched on this at the, with our summary slide at, at, the, at the onset here, but what's gonna get constructed in 22? Um, so we have that in that orange uh, hatch color, um, that a bulk of Highway 13 will get built um, along with the bridge that's gonna go up and over Dakota, um, along with some of that temporary pavement that I mentioned, uh, we're gonna build some of that. What, that. what that temporary pavement's gonna do, it's gonna allow us to provide that one-way frontage road um, to the ports. 
And it's also gonna, it also allows us to maintain that one lane of traffic each way through construction. Um, so that's uh, what we uh, are, are planning to accomplish in 22. I do wanna mention that um, we really, uh, we understand that we're restricting traffic quite a bit to, to even going down to the one lane each way. Um, so we really strived to um, try to keep, you know, try to keep that one lane each way throughout. Uh, but there are some, a, a few things that we need to do, um, some utility work, that sort of thing, that is unfortunately gonna require us to close Highway 13 um, to, to make those connections. We're gonna strive to keep that at a minimum, um, those, those, those closures. But what we wanna do is we wanna keep those closures to the weekends. Um, so really try and stay out of the main week and, and, and keep that one lane traffic each way. Um, but we're gonna have uh, a potentially a few um, weekend closures to do this. And you know, when we, when we uh, have those weekend closures, the detour route will uh, be on 494. So that's why I wanted to bring this up now in 2022. I mentioned the 494 project getting built in 20, 2023. So uh, in 2022, we felt we could detour traffic to, to 494 during the weekends. Um, again, re we are really striving to keep that, uh, those types of closures to a minimum. All right, so I mentioned the winter suspension. So we were able to build enough. We, we feel that um, with our staging, we're able to build enough in, 20, uh, in uh, the 2022 construction season that we can get, uh, we can restore traffic back to uh, four lanes, two lanes each way on uh, Highway 13. But the, um, the, uh, the U-turns and the one-way uh, frontage road will remain in place through the winter. So uh, access will still be restricted at Dakota and Yosemite. So we're gonna maintain that, uh, the U-turns and the one-way frontage roads for access to and from the ports. And then starting back up in, in 2023, right away in the spring, um, we are uh, um, gonna finish the, uh, Highway 13, as we can see here, and then also um, really start working on the the ramps at Dakota Ave uh, at Dakota Avenue to and from. So uh, a, a slight change in how the frontage road is going to work. So before um, we had a ramp that that kind of a temporary ramp that that took uh, traffic from Dakota and Yosemite and and on the um, 13 to the west. Um, we're going to switch it up and there'll be a two way frontage road between Dakota and Yosemite. Um, and then that access will access there at Yosemite to get on to Highway 13. So access will still be there uh, for the ports. It's just in a different spot uh, during this time frame. And again, our U turns are, are still in place through here. All right, so I mentioned um, getting Highway 13 construction done, getting the ramps done, getting the bridge done. So we're gonna have, you know, we envision that being done by June or July of 20, 2023. Um, now we gotta build the frontage roads, uh, the north and south frontage roads. And so um, uh, with that, I mentioned traffic will be restored back to four, lane, four lanes, two lanes each way on Highway 13. Um, we're going to have to build the frontage roads uh, piecemeal um, to be able to maintain access to our to our businesses, and um, really, it's you know, uh, keeping one access open to a business while we construct another, and kind of working our way um, through the through the construction of the south frontage road, and then and then up to the north frontage road. So, um, one thing I do want to point out is that we have been. Uh, closely coordinating with our uh, with, with with the businesses along the south front of Jordan and with the ports in this area on this construction. So we've been uh, having a lot of good uh, conversations there, getting a lot of good feedback um, from them on how to construct this. So, 
right? So that's how to build the, the, the project is just one piece of the puzzle here. And the other elements of the, of the traffic management plan is really one, understanding the traffic impacts um, to the surrounding network. And like I mentioned, we're, we're, we're going down to one lane each way on Highway 13. So that's gonna have impacts to our network. Um, and then two is, is understanding and, and implementing some mitigation strategies, some, some ways to mitigate those traffic impacts to the network. And then the third piece of this, and this is uh, really kind of a, an ongoing piece once we get into construction is, is really monitoring how traffic is, is um, um, behaving in the network. And, and if there's some areas that are, are starting to um, um, cause concern that we have uh, some ideas in place to implement uh, a, a sequence or a, some strategy of some certain uh, of some potential items to to help mitigate um, those spots. So it's a. Uh, I do want to say that the the traffic management plan is is really a a it it lives through the construction of the project. Um, and one thing I do want to mention as well, and we have uh, at the big, at the onset here, we we uh, pointed out we got a, a bunch of our agency partners on the line here. This plan really was developed uh, in conjunction with all our agency partners, you know, Scott County, City of Savage, Dakota County, uh, City of Burnsville, um, our, our transit um, agencies uh, along here. Um, and I also mentioned the, we, we were talking with the, the, the different businesses, the ports, self friendly businesses. And then also uh, we, were, we have been uh, talking with the local um, uh, emergency responders as well as we've developed this plan. So um, a lot of uh, agency coordination has really gone into this. But I kind of mentioned that uh, you know, going down to one lane each way on Highway 13 and the impact to the network, uh, we are anticipating diversion of, of traffic. We're, we're anticipating traffic to kind of move to different spots on the network. And, and we kind of show that in blue on these different uh, different roadways in the network, um, you know, Highway 13 South. Uh, um, we are anticipating uh, folks wanting to use that self furniture road, uh, McCall Drive, McCall Williams, um, and then, uh, County Road 14, County Road 18, and County Road 21, amongst other routes that will will likely see uh, increased traffic. Part of our uh, so so part two of the TM uh, the traffic management plan that I mentioned is, is really developing those mitigation strategies. And what we want to do is kind of run through what we plan to implement um, with the construction plans uh, of the project. Um, so these are these are uh, items at the that the, the, con the contractor that gets selected for this will, will need to implement in, um, throughout, the, throughout the construction of the project. And I wanted to start maybe a little bit larger scale and we'll kind of work our way um, to a little bit more local scale. Um, so starting off, we, we really feel advanced signage kind of throughout the roadway network, even up at 494. Mm -hmm. Um, to, to give travelers some information on what's occurring on Highway 13 is important. Um, so having those changeable message signs um, that, that uh, MnDOT has um, um, throughout their system available to us to get information out, um, along with uh, just putting in some uh, proposed portable uh, changeable message signs and some uh, proposed just static signs or signs that are gonna uh, stay in place uh, through the project. So really trying to get that advanced signage out ahead of um, um, our construction zone is important. I mentioned that, uh, uh, again, we will likely have a, um, some weekend closures of Highway 13 to do some utility work and some cro you know, crossing work on Highway 13. 
um, that uh, 494 would be our, our detour route. And so, um, you know, deploying those signs um, and having these signs um, at the ready to, to um, give travelers that information to use 494 for that route. Um, another strategy, and I, I mentioned traffic um, uh, along 126 in Louisiana um, and the South Frontage Road. Again, we, we really, uh, again, um, it was important to us to, to maintain the access to our businesses um, through the area and, and also uh, provide an, an avenue for our bus traffic as well. Um, and we really want to keep this route to our local traffic and our bus traffic. Um, so really what we, we um, it'll be important for uh, some of our, our dedicated police enforcement right off the bat to really make sure people are, are following um, the rules of the road through here, the speed limits and the stop signs and, and the traffic control through here. So having some dedicated police enforcement through here um, right at the onset um, we're hoping really, really helps kind of uh, the, the traffic along here. And then we do want to keep traffic moving uh, through here to get to our businesses. And so parking bans along 126 in Louisiana, um, we feel will, will kind of help with uh, traffic mobility through here. I do want to point out in uh, kind of showing up in red on the screen um, is 126 in Louisiana Avenue. Part of this project as well is to um, uh, do some pavement replacement on that at the onset of the project um, to really help that pavement kind of help to hold up through construction when we have our when we have our trucks and our buses and everything kind of running uh, our 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 local business trucks kind of running through here um, that that pavement holds up through the through the course of the construction so. I just did want to point out that um, we'll be doing at the very onset of the project, doing uh, improving that pavement in that area. All right. Um, so, kind of talked a little bit about some, I'll, I'll call it traffic mobility strategies. Um, the other piece of this is really that that, that we're really looking at is uh, traffic safety. And so along Highway 13, there, there was a, a few strategies that we are going to um, put into place. And that is um, travel time information um, system. And as you can see up in the top right there, um, just giving, giving folks an idea of how long it's gonna take to get through the, through the construction zone. Um, and we, Another good safety feature that we wanted to employ is uh, traffic backup warning system. So when we start having some traffic backups um, occurring uh, during rush hours and that sort of thing, um, that we have, we, we provide that advance warning to folks so they don't, um, so there isn't an accident or an incident um, uh, due to, to traffic backups. And then uh, also uh, dynamic speed display signs uh, we, we, we feel are pretty important. We, um, we are anticipating uh, wanting to lower the traffic through the construction zone. Um, and so having these signs in place to get people to slow down in advance of the, of the construction zone is very important, um, not only to the safety of the drivers, but also to the safety of the construction workers that are out there. And then uh, we also have some uh, local road safety strategies that, that we want to employ. And we, we have a few slides for these that um, um, we'll follow here. But again, using uh, those dynamic speed display signs. Um, also, uh, in our school zone, uh, having some school zone safety measures uh, and some low bridge clearance sign some uh, alerting tra uh, tra travelers to the low clearances that we have at Quentin and Lynn. And then uh, uh, closing, closing uh, some local roads to traffic, uh, local traffic only. So we'll get into those right now. Uh, we felt a good safety strategy along McCall and Williams was to 
have uh, those dynamic speed signs in place as well uh, through this area. As we mentioned, we are anticipating uh, uh, more traffic along this route. Uh, so we felt these signs would be uh, important. Um, we, we, you know, we we have a, a trail crossing, tra a trail crossing over at Rose Bluff. We have the, the transition, you know, from the four lane to the three lane section in this area. So we want to, we really wanted to manage the speeds through this area. So uh, we have the uh, dynamic speed display signs along the Colin Williams. Uh, we wanted to employ a similar similar signs, but uh, really alerting folks to the school zone along Lynn Avenue here. Um, so we'll have uh, um, warning signs and speed display signs um, in advance of the school on Lynn Avenue. And then I mentioned the, um, the clearance. Uh, really, we want to alert um travelers to the clearance issues at both Lynn and and Quinton at the railroad bridges um because if you can imagine if if somebody does not know about that wants to get through the area and cannot make it under there that that will cause some major traffic uh, impacts um, on those roadways we want to get that out in front that Hey, if you're if you're if you're got a higher clearance than this, that this isn't the route for you. So uh, we wanted to really get that advance notice out there for these uh, for those bridge clearances. And then um, we really want to discourage traffic, cut through traffic on Glenhurst and Rose Bluff Boulevard. So. What we want to do there is, is do some road close signs um, to, uh, to through traffic. So only allow through traffic through this area. Um, so we will uh, uh, put those at each end. So I mentioned um, uh, a monitoring plan being the, the, the third portion or the third part of the traffic management plan. And, and like I mentioned, and it's kind of in the bullet here is it's, it's continuous monitoring throughout the construction, uh, throughout construction for operational issues. And I mentioned uh, just uh, when we developed this TMP, just all the agency coordination that went into this. Well, that agency coordination is gonna continue through construction um, with all of our different agencies. Um, and, and um, you know, MnDOT has, we, we talked about all their changeable message signs that they have on their system. Well, they also have traffic cameras throughout their, throughout their system and they can use, use those traffic cameras to really monitor uh, um, if there's any, any traffic concerns. Um, the city and county have boots on the ground, have, have uh, um, maintenance folks and inspectors and emergency responders out there and, and seeing what the traffic is doing. And so uh, all that in conjunction with uh, um, this project, uh, having, having a dedicated business liaison, we'll be, uh, we'll be constantly monitoring the, the, the not only the project, it's the construction itself, but the, the roadway network around it. Um, and um, there are a few other spot locations that uh, could potentially see a little bit more traffic. Um, and those uh, locations are at um, uh, 101, not only um, uh, eastbound between Highway 60, 169 and Highway 13, but also even the, uh, the exit at uh, Southbound 169 are some areas that we'll, uh, we'll be monitoring in particular and, and have, some, uh, have some mitigations ha at the ready. Uh, we, we talked a lot about all the, the different portable devices and electronic devices and things that, that we can use. So um, really having those uh, mitigations or, or potential ideas in place to kind of help uh, alert traffic will be important. 
and very uh, very and, and the same for um, our uh, southbound uh, Highway 13 movement and with the, with the turn to McCall. That'll be another area that we uh, that we'll be watching um, and monitoring and and um, having some some potential mitigations at the ready for the contractor. All right, thanks, Craig. Um, I just have a, a little bit of wrap up here and then we'll definitely open it up for any questions. Um, as Craig kind of mentioned, he went through the detailed schedule, but we're, we're wrapping up our final design plans um, at the moment and getting ready for that spring 2022 construction start for Dakota Avenue. Um, there's many ways to stay um, up to date on the project as we enter the construction phase. And those are on the right hand side of the screen. Um, the project website is a great resource to go to um, just continuously, um, but you're also able to sign up for email updates. Um, we are kind of getting out there and, and sharing the word and we've been doing many different presentations and such to different groups and we're, we're very happy to entertain a, an idea to do another one. So let us know. And then there's some contact information on the screen for um, Michael Corbett with MnDOT, who's on our call today, and his email and, and contact information. So a lot more to come um, with, with you know, the actual getting underway of construction, but we wanted to share where we're at with both the corridor and the project itself, and I'm happy to kind of open it up for questions that I think Joy is going to help us through here. Yes, thank you, Angie and Craig, for that presentation. So we will open it up for questions if you have any for any of the project staff about any of the information that you were presented with tonight. So definitely if you have a question, feel free to raise your hand. I'd be happy to call on you um, or you can leave your question in the chat and I can read it off as well. Um, or you can also just unmute yourself and uh, ask your question out loud. Feel free to turn your video on if you'd like to as well. So opening it up, if anyone has any questions, feel free. Um, let's go with Justin first. Justin? All right, figured I'd jump in. Um, Justin Thank you. Hoff, student, <laughs> um, Environmental Health and Safety Manager for Fabcon Precast. Um, just a quick little question. If this is out of the scope of this meeting, let me know. <laughs> I know I've talked to a few of you in the past. But um, anyway, so in regards to Fabcon Precast, so. I know for those of you who have talked with um, and are familiar that uh, Fabcon has some very uh, strict environmental uh, requirements set forth by the MPCA in particular around two streams that go um, through our site that are gonna be affected by the project over towards Dakota Avenue. So I was taking a look at Appendix K that you guys published on pages 10 and 11 and what I'm kind of referring to is the tributary waters on flow number two, W20, W17, and W16. Um, in regards to those bodies of water, um, we conduct monthly sampling, monitoring. Um, it's also going into our annual reports. So with this project, um, do we foresee any changes to those streams that go in front of our property or is there a plan in place to make sure that those don't get altered, things of that nature, just so we're in the know in case we need to change our, basically our stormwater plan or things of that nature. Yep, uh, this is Tony uh, with, uh, with the design team and I actually was uh, helping lead the hydraulics design for the project. So I'm very familiar with the, uh, the water bodies you're talking about, Justin, and really, uh, from a drainage standpoint for the project, um, you know, towards the river between uh, the river and the highway at the railroad, right? And so uh, we're not we're not or not doing any changes to their drainage infrastructure with the project. Um, so we really can't send any more water uh, to their property without having impacts to them. So what I'm getting at is the project is meant and designed such that the flows um, under Highway 13 um, that convey that water from your site are, are designed not to change. I and mean, we will have some temporary culvert connections that need to facilitate drainage during construction itself. 
Uh, but we, similar to you, are held to PCA standards as well regarding controlling our sediment um, and making sure it doesn't impact those receiving waters. Um, and so since you're, since where you're testing, I'm guessing is upstream of our project, I would not anticipate any changes to any of the monitoring requirements or any, any, you know, sediment loading that you might see in those streams that would impact any of your, um, any of your, your testing requirements. And if there are, our contractor is mandated to uh, clean those up. If we get a big rain, you know, sometimes it's hard to control the sediment, uh, but that's why we have stipulations in our contract for the contractor to clean that stuff up. If we do get a big event, that does create some sediment. Wonderful. That's your question? Yes, it does. Thank you so much. <laughs> I appreciate it. <laughs> Great. Thank you for your question, Justin, and your response, Tony. Um, Pat G, you had a question or a comment? Um, yeah, thank you. I had a question basically about noise. Um, recently moved into the area um, and only a block or so off of Highway 13. Um, not directly across from this initial phase of the construction project further east. Um, how should I explain? Just a, a little bit further east. Um, so it's already a pretty noisy highway. Um, is, if I understand this right, there's more projects after this one's completed. You mentioned um, Quentin Avenue, Lynn Avenue, um, Nicollet. So there's other projects down the road from this one, correct? That's correct, yes. And, and the exact configuration um, at those intersections is, is yet to be defined. We've narrowed it to you know, a few different options. Um, and when, it, when we secure funding and determine exactly what to build, we will have to update that environmental document that I talked about, which would include a, noise, a more detailed noise analysis specific to that configuration. Um, you know, are we building a bridge? Are we staying at grade? That would, that would all change um, kind of the noise um, that impacts. And we would take another look at that and, and really update it to say, do we need any what we call mitigation in terms of noise barriers or such? So that's a little bit to be determined in the future and revisited. Okay, okay, thank you. And is there, my other question, when you showed pictures of those um, two old railroad bridges, um, one's off Quentin, one's off Lynn, mm -hmm. um, and I've been through both of them, is there any plans to, I mean, I see weeds and stuff growing in the tracks as you're going under the tracks. Um, so they're obviously not being used. Is there any plans to improve the safety of, you know, maybe tearing out the overhead bridges or making them easier to navigate through? Yeah, and I'm wondering if thing is on the call, if you wanna talk about kind of where the city's at with local road improvements and that, that evaluation. Thank you, Angie, and thank you, Pat, for that question. Excellent question, we get that quite a bit. Um, uh, the two bridges, there's actually three bridges within the area, there's actually two on Quinton. Um, if you look at Quinton, there's one on Quinton itself, and as well as there's another bridge over the river, so there's two bridges there. Mm -hmm. And then we also talked, well, there's another one on Lynn Avenue as well. So there's some challenges, the railroad still has rights to use of that rail on top of the bridges. Um, the city owns the bridge. We, take, we took it over from the railroads uh, on Quinton, uh, but they still have the reserve the rights to use that. So um, are there plans in the future? Yes, there is. Um, unfortunately, they're costly at this point. Um, you know, we are trying to get funding as best as we can uh, from a city perspective. We are constantly looking for additional funding scenarios or different funding allocations to be able to replace those bridges. Um, mm -hmm. There's certain requirements when we replace those bridges, you know, from a clearance standpoint and kind of widening the roadway. So there's additional costs associated with that. So there's also the fact that even if we replace the bridges, um, there isn't a guarantee the railroad's gonna use those areas again. Uh, I think that some of the, uh, I would say heartburn the city is to put up a new bridge and yet it's not being used and you know deteriorates over time again. So, um, so there are some challenges. We are, you know, always looking for funding in terms of those bridge replacements. Um, 
just recently, I think we put in a solicitation, I think through the center's offices in terms of some of those fundings, but we haven't heard anything back. Uh, mm -hmm. So they are fairly expensive and we're hoping, you know, eventually in the future, we should be able to get something done, but uh, more to come on that one. Okay, thank you. Thanks for your question, Pat, and thanks for your response saying. So we do have a question in the chat from Tim. Is there any thought to help drivers from Taylor Drive exit onto McCall if McCall traffic increases significantly? Craig, can you respond? Yeah, yeah, Tim, and uh, we kind of touched on it a little bit that we are expecting more traffic on McCall and Williams. And, you know, our initial uh, mitigation that, that will occur with the project is those uh, speed signs. Um, and, and this isn't also an area that we'll continue to monitor as well and, and, and look at, you know, if it does become a concern, well, maybe a few options are to continue to lower the traffic some more and make it not as an appealing as a, uh, of a route. Or um, are there ways for the neighborhoods to find other ways to get access to uh, Linda McCall via some, some other side roads? Um, or uh, do, we, do we not allow left turns out of, out of these, uh, out of these uh, kind of the neighborhoods and that sort of thing? And, and maybe just do a right in, right out. So um, there's gonna be some things that, that we're, uh, we'll continue to look at and, and watch for as, as, uh, as construction progresses here. But uh, those are just some of the things we're, we're kind of thinking about. Thanks, Craig. So Tim, I hope that answers your question. Um, let us know if you'd like us to expand. We do wanna thank you again for participating in tonight's uh, open house for Highway 13. We really appreciate everyone's participation throughout this whole process. Um, and again, as Angie mentioned, to continue to get updates on the project, especially as construction comes around next spring, please go to the project website and sign up for the project updates. Um, you can also reach out to project staff, uh, Michael Corbett. If you have any other additional questions, we just want to thank you once again. Um, and we hope that everyone has a great evening. And thank you for joining us tonight. <laughs>